Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I am most confident you will be glad that you did. My name is Rita Wolfson, and I'm representing the Center for Financial Social Work. And we have a terrific trainer and training for you on addressing chronic poverty, the high cost of being poor. With me today is Linda Benjamin, our relationship manager, and Olga is with us, and she does all things tech. So our guest speaker, Paul, and Paul can, when he introduces himself in a little while, when I end it off him, he can tell you more about himself. So I'm so glad you're here because one of the really special things about financial social work is that it improves lives personally, those of us who are social workers and other helping professionals, as well as professionally. So just some housekeeping that there will be messages in the chat box. I know people tend to love all of our slides. We don't share them. They are proprietary and it takes a very long time to create these programs. However, we do share the recording with you and that recording will be on our YouTube channel, on our website and on our Facebook page in the next few days. If you have questions, you can put them in the question box and we'll answer as many as time permits at the end of the training. There are no CEs or certificates of attendance for this webinar, but our financial social work certification does include 20 CEUs from National NASW. So I all like to suggest that everyone take a few deep breaths in and a few long exhales because when we talk about money, it brings up a lot of different thoughts, feelings, beliefs, ideas some of them positive, some of them less positive. So we like to center ourselves to, be get, to get ready to think about and talk more about money. And I like to start these trainings with our financial social work affirmation. It goes just for today. I will love myself enough to face my fears, practice self-acceptance and embrace hope, silence my inner critic, speak my truth and make peace with myself and with my past. Just for today, I will give myself permission to eliminate toxic people, beliefs and behaviors from my life and prepare for a better tomorrow by healing my relationship with my money today. And I think that captures the over 25 years I've dedicated to creating financial social work. So we're just going to start out with this picture. Take a moment to look at it and then share with us in the question box, what does it make you think of? We've been doing these pictures at the beginning of our trainings for a while now, and it's just Fabulous. We just enjoy hearing what everybody thinks about when they see a picture like this. And Linda Benjamin will be sharing your responses. Anybody? Oh, we share? have a lot. We have, okay. Uh, let's see. We have Apple Pay, Google Pay, Cashless Pay, Money, Fraud, Easy Spending, Cash App, Technology, Shopping. The connection between money and your phone, banking apps, how most of our finances are on our phone, too easy to spend money, 
Thank you, Elise. Money becoming digital, impulse buying, debt. The it changing is. world, losing yeah. control over our private information and finances. That's amazing, Sonia. Easy to spend. Thank you. False sense of available money. That's awesome, Karina. Thank you. Everything can be done from your phone. And Tammy says, this makes her think of the halo of credit. Hmm. I just Kathy, love this. Uh, did you have some more? We, we're getting yeah, into lack of control over money. Um, interest and help sometimes. Ah, Lauren, unconscious spending. Boy, we could just spend the whole next hour talking <laughs> about all of those things. You know, as I, most of you know that I spend a lot of time on this work. And when I find um, interesting pictures, I save them now so that we can do this. And it brings up so many thoughts and feelings and and things that we, you know, aren't consciously thinking about, but that are going on for us when it comes to money. I mean, the idea of losing your phone when you have all your banking on it, it just is like not too good. And all of the thoughts that you shared. Thank you so much, everybody. Okay, so we're just going to give you an overview of financial social work because some of you are definitely new to us. Uh, having this large registration, we know that, uh, and want you to know why it is that every month we offer a free workshop like this, a free training. It's because we know that no one chooses to have money problems, but sadly, most people do. Um, so that's where financial social work comes in. It is the intersection of social work, politics, the economy, gender, economic, and social justice, and addressing all inequity. And again, we could spend a lot of time just talking about that, but we're not going to, because Paul has a great training for you. So the major things you should know about financial social work is that it is a behavioral model because until and unless behavior changes, nothing changes. So what we're talking about is that it is so much more than just the dollars, cents, budgets, debt. There's a lot to consider. So we do. Financial social work explores the financial thoughts, feelings, attitudes, beliefs, experiences, and values that we and clients bring to our relationship with money and our relationship with ourselves because that psychosocial component drives financial behavior. And for us, we're talking about how we earn, spend, save, share, and borrow. It is all of these things, financial social work, is interactive, reflective, supportive, engaging, motivational, strengths-based. It is holistic, multidisciplinary, Hopeful, helpful, and you start to get the idea there. It is very heart-centered. It approaches money and life from a perspective of healing, acceptance, courage, wellness, and honesty. And the focus, the very core of financial social work is about healing the relationship we each have with our money and we each have with ourselves. So we have thousands of graduates around the world as well as across the country. And now it does, gives me a lot of pleasure and you are going to get so much out of this. I am going to turn this over to Paul and he can begin his training. You have it, Paul? Paul? 
Yep, sorry. I had to unmute myself. I'm going to show my screen. Um, all righty. Can everyone see um, the first slide? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you so much for allowing me the time here, Rita. Um, I would like to say that I'm a financial social work graduate, a certified financial social worker, and um, Rita's model really provided um, some game changers in my understanding of money and social work. So thank you, Rita. Um, so I also want to be respectful of your time today. So the agenda that we have here is addressing that we have a financial problem here. We're going to talk about why financial literacy or loan is not enough. We're going to address some changes um, and how we accomplish them. And then we're going to finish up by reviewing the work that's already being done. So uh, first, I think it's important that we go over some players in the system. And in case you're not familiar with them, here's the quick, quick reference. So the first thing that I would like for us to talk about is the CPI or the Consumer Price Index. Um, the CPI is a collection of prices that are weighted according to the amount of money that the typical urban consumer spends on each item. The resulting index reflects the average changes in prices over time for this representative basket of goods and services. So it's not individual, but things together. The CPI is often used as a measure of inflation because it provides a broad-based measure of changes in prices that affect consumers. It is used by policymakers, businesses, and individuals to make decisions about a wide range of economic, economic issues, such as wage increases, investment decisions, and cost of living adjustments for people who may have uh, retiree benefits or social security. Um, the agency that collects this data um, does it through methods of uh, surveying, they uh, do polling, um, and also through governmental surveys, um, which um, is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, the BSL provides data that is used by policymakers and business alike um, to make decisions to help understand economic trends. For example, the BSL's data on employment and wages are used to determine the federal minimum wage and to monitor trends in the labor market. Um, and they are also the institution that will monitor things like inflation. So the CPI is important as a national trend, but the cost of living index, the COLE, is a regional measurement of this. So um, the United States is a huge place. So um, what we see here is the COLE will be more specific to your region. It's more geographically based. Um, so then what we have here is inflation, which is um, the cost of living increases. Um, and it can really have disproportionate effect on people living um, in poverty or really all over in any income bracket. Um, high inflation can make it more difficult for low income households to avoid their basic necessities, such as food, housing, and healthcare. Um, also, inflation can also reduce the value of money over time, which we will see, and this can have disproportionately or disproportionate effects from people living in poverty all the way up to the middle class. Um, it's often used as a metric for our economy um, and to measure the uh, economic state strong, recession, and how, um, what have you. All right. So. We have a problem. I'm sorry to tell you. $100 doesn't spend like it used to. This graphic, while it may look like a meme, is actually not. It's the actual trend in buying power of $100 since 1970 um, to the current year 2023. If you're thinking, well, I've always been good with money, I've always saved, I spent proportionally, what's changed? Well, like Rita said, financial behavior is important, but your behavior hasn't changed. You're still doing well. It's the value of money that went down, or rather how much things cost. While individual responsibility and good choices can be a factor in having good finan uh, finances, this is not something, as I'm aware of, that the everyday consumer can change by themselves. So um, to provide evidence for this in a little bit of context, I was able to pull some inflation rates in the 90s 
and what a hundred dollars could buy. So if you wanted to buy something from 1990, that was a hundred dollars, like maybe a PlayStation one when I was little, or maybe a big screen TV, which nowadays isn't all that big. Um, depending on where you were, you'd need more than a hundred dollars now. So yes, I realized that features and things and HDR and whatnot. But um, if all factors were accounted for um, in San Francisco, you need 155 bucks more. San Fran is 221. Um, and if all factors were accounted for, it's not anything that you're doing, but it's rather the system that is um, dictating this. So they think just naturally raise in price. Um, so it's really important here to look at the inflation rates um, for these places in the 90s because um, the measure of inflation right now, uh, I was able to look it up, it's about 4.93%, um, which is lower than last month at 4.98. Um, and it's a lot lower than this time last year, which was 8.26%. Um, however, as you can see, going back to the 90s, um, it's higher than the long-term average of about 3.2%. Um, so that's pretty, whew, that's pretty sombering. Um, next up, we have a question. If you could reply in chat when you started your career, what do you remember the minimum wage was? Um, if you can include the year that you started working, but if you're not comfortable with that, you can include the decade. Um, for example, I'll start when I was um, working, which was about 2010, um, the minimum wage was 725 and that's what I got. Uh, we have 725, 625, $3.45 in 2005, $5.25. Oh my gosh, says someone, $7.25, three dollars. $5.25, $2.95 plus tips, mm -hmm. $3.75, $5.25 in 1995. And I'll add that uh, a long time ago, I think the minimum wage when I started working was about $1.50. That is, that is, that's uh, not a lot. No, mm -mm. it's four dollars and twenty-five cents in nineteen ninety-five, and somebody just commented, "Tammy, you're right. I am old." You're not old. You're vintage. You're experienced. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so you can see that there's a lot of different. Um, there's there's a lot of variability, but I heard a lot of seven twenty-five and survey says. Well, according to the um, Economic Policy Institute, from about 1970 to 2010, it's been approximately the same, um, which is a problem. The cost of goods has went up, but it's about as easy to make $100 as it was in the 70s. Um, as you can see from the uh, picture on the slide, the minimum wage should be over $18 if it had actually risen with productivity. So $7.25 to $18. Now, I'm a social worker, I do feelings. Um, I'm not so great at math, but that's, that's, that's bad. Um, so 1970 for me to 2010, that's 40 years where we haven't seen much change. Um, while individual states may vary, there is really little incentive to change based on federal standards. And while negotiations may be a part of wage, um, you know, uh, hiring practices, without a higher base to work from, it's unlikely that someone will obtain a raise based on the need that they have for inflation instead of what they're offering. Um, so people aren't paying a living wage. And according to MIT, this really shows it. Um, this graphic demonstrates that the federal minimum wage hasn't went up since about the 1970s. Um, a little bit of history here. I think that it was FDR, if I'm not mistaken, that said 
that the minimum wage should be a living wage. He said, it seems to me to be equally plain that no business which depends for existence on paying less than wages, less than a living wage to its workers has any right to continue in this country. By workers, I mean all workers, the white collar class, as well as the men in overall. And by living wage, I mean more than a bare substantive level. I mean the wages of decent living. What we can see here is that um, for different family configurations, they have labeled the living wage, the poverty wage, and the minimum wage. And um, you can see that nowhere does this come close to a living wage. So what we can see here is that the minimum wage does not provide a living wage for most Americans. A typical family of four, two working adults, two children, needs to work more than two full-time minimum wage jobs, a 96-hour work week per working adult to earn a living wage. Single parent families need to work almost twice as hard as families with two working adults to make a living wage. A single mother with two children earning a federal minimum wage job of 7.25 per hour needs to work 252 hours per week. That is the equivalent of almost six full-time minimum wage jobs to make a living. And I don't know about you, but if I had to work six minimum wage jobs, I think that the Starbucks that we're always hearing about would be an actual necessity instead of a luxury. Um, so what we can see here is that this is not irresponsible spending, it is really a systems problem. So here is a uh, formula for calculating the buying power, which will come in handy later. If there is something that you're looking for, you take the year in which you're in, so for this year it'd be 2023, and then you divide it by the year in which you were trying to measure it to. The year that you um, are comparing it to, you times it by the US dollar value, and then you would have the value here. So if we're talking about something, uh, the cost of living um, in 2023 versus something in 2020, we would divide that times by 100 and that's what it would be. So um, it is, the CPI is really used to calculate a broad basket of goods, like I said earlier, but just to prove a point, I wanted to show you how we might calculate um, the inflation rate for a gallon of milk, which is uh, fantastic here. Um, so what we do is take the average current price minus the previous price. So for this one, it would be 2013 to 2022. And then we would divide it by that and times it for 100. And the 100 is just used to convert it to percent. So um, let's do this, everyone. If you can take a moment to, um, to do a little bit of math, what would be the increase for, um, for the uh, gallon of milk? And it's okay, you can cry over spilled milk just this one time because it's expensive. Do we have any uh, answers yet? We have 118%. Um, I want to comment on that, but I will wait just a couple more seconds. Is it, and then we have a question, is it 19%? So depending on where we're putting rounding, it what I calculated to was 19.95%. Go social workers and professionals who can do math. I am proud of you. Oh, Liliana, Liliana's right on, right on it. She's right on the spot on. Liliana, I like you. Thank you. Um, so, um, so these are uh, I averaged some of the numbers here, but 
this is kind of concerning. Um, I was doing some research. The average inflation rate in the United States over the past decade, so for this would be 2013 to 22, has been approximately 1.8% per year. So we would still expect that to be about 18%, but it's actually just a little bit higher. So that's that's concerning. It definitely shows that this is definitely more of a systems problem. Um, so some of the other things that we can see here, um, these are barriers that people may uh, may face um, when we're talking about cyclical poverty or generational wealth. Um, I, again, want to be conscious on your time. We could spend so much time talking about this. Um, and these categories, as you can see, are not exhaustive. But um, if this is of interest to you, there are one or two that I'm going to be going over. But I'd recommend checking out the Center for Financial and Social Work channel on YouTube and reviewing them that way. So that way you can really absorb the information here. Um, but the one that I would really like to highlight here is the limited store access. And the reason why is because this is really a multi-faceted issue, especially due to being bound in the transportation system, super especially if you don't have personal transportation, which we touched on in the next slide. But there's also a quality of food difference here. A selection of food from different stores such as Kroger, Walmart, Publix, you know, depending where you're located, um, as opposed to your neighborhood bodega or convenience store, they're, they're not only their price difference, they're going to be paying more at the smaller stores, but the selection of food may not be as great either. Um, and if you're not getting great food and nutrition, it can lead, if you go jump down to here, to increased healthcare costs, which, um, as we can see, many of these barriers are not mutually exclusive. Systems of oppression do tend to run together, and while there may be things that we can do to help manage them on the day to day scale, the long term exposure to chronic stress is bad for us and for our budgets. And these are just others you can um, look at here. Um, if there's any comments or anything that really um, resonate with you, feel free to put in the chat and we can go over it later. So if the previous two slides were on a micro or individual scale, then this would be on a macro or large scale. Um, and here are some common effects that we see from generational poverty. Overall, on a national society scale, or societal scale, it reduces economic growth. It can increase crime rates when people don't have access to the things they need to survive. It limits access to education and it contributes to overall poor health, health outcomes. Um, and funny enough, when I was researching this, it made me think of the social determinants of health. Um, and these effects we see from generational poverty, the trauma from poverty, map onto these really great um, for those of you who might not be aware, social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, as well as the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. So these can include some of the economic policies, the development agendas, social norms, and political systems that we live in. Um, they also are largely responsible for some of the health inequities that we see. The unfair and unavoidable differences in health status seen here in between different communities and even different countries. Uh, the social determinants of health um, include what is you see on the, the slide. Um, and these factors really do have an impact on our health in the outcomes. Um, when we have a sick system, we have sick people and we have a sick society. Um, again, I wanna be mindful of time. So I'm going to put these here um, and then I'm going to scroll through them. Um, one thing that I do want to make sure that is touched upon is um, some of these, in, especially education, healthcare, are much more bleak and frightening, and we, we just simply cannot ignore them. While America has enjoyed many, many years as a leader in many respects, for better or for worse, if we continue to want to compete, we need to address these educational and healthcare components. Um, if we're going to be taken seriously again. Um, and one thing I do want to point out here is that I don't mean that there's a hierarchical relationship, but healthier people um, may be able to help generate more economic stability and are better for our neighborhoods and our communities. So financial literacy versus financial change. 
Financial literacy can help us make smart financial decisions, empower people. Investing can help us grow our income to an extent, meet financial goals, and provide opportunities that otherwise would not be there. Great. That addresses like none of the things that I just talked about. Financial literacy alone cannot reduce inflation, increase wages, modify the cost of living, and fix our system on a societal level. Financial literacy alone is not enough. This is a systems problem. You cannot budget your way out of poverty. You cannot save and spend money that just isn't there. So I would like for us to um, address some of the mechanisms to change the system. Um, I hope at this point you are sufficiently invested and understand that it's not avocado toast in Starbucks that's the problem. It's the system. So how do we change it? Well, as a social worker, I propose working together, which is shocking, isn't it? I think that one of the answers that we can double up on are the use of interdisciplinary teams um, that would show effective use for change. So why? Why, interdiscipl why interdisciplinary teams? Great question. Um, because no one person can do it all. Whether that's because of burnout, it's not within your scope of practice, you don't have a good work-life balance, whatever that is, um, or, you know, there are only 24 hours in a day and it is literally impossible. However, what we do see is that there are some benefits to working together. There are um, additional skill and role diversities. Um, we can more ethically provide services um, and have them be more comprehensive, increase trust between professions, improved outcomes for the people we serve, and increase competency through specialization. Um, Interdisciplinary teams bring together professionals from all different levels, each with their own unique expertise and perspective. This diversity of perspectives can lead to more creative and innovative solutions to really complex problems. Interdisciplinary teams can also make a more comprehensive approach to problem solving, taking into account a wide range of factors that may be relevant to the issues at hand that one person may not be able to, to uh, brainstorm all at once. Um, and again, you know, communication is really important. Um, we are all professionals and we all have something that we can do to help. So we can break down this working in silos approach by facilitating the exchange of ideas and knowledge. Um, and really it's, it's a more holistic approach. Um, whether it be problem solving or taking into account different social, economic, or environmental factors that may impact the issue we're dealing with, having more minds at the table can be really effective. Um, so, you know, the benefits related to interdisciplinary teams, um, how this might look for someone, a physician may stabilize someone and provide documentation for benefits. A uh, therapist may help motivate and stabilize their mental health. Lawyers can help manage assets, particularly uh, for people who may be on Medicaid. Um, and a quick plug, if someone is on Medicaid and has a disability, I highly recommend checking out the ABLE account um, on the Financial Social Work uh, YouTube channel. It's really good and also done by me. Uh, plug over. But, you know, some um, the policymakers can change the system, create higher asset limits or programs to help people um, meet their needs. And teachers, which I haven't touched upon a lot, they can ensure that people have critical thinking skills and fundamental education to be part of society. Um, so, you know, as a social worker, I'm sure that you guys wouldn't want me arguing your real estate case in court. Um, just like I'm sure that you don't want your attorney to install a pacemaker. So that's really why it takes a whole village. Think back to the, um, the social determinants of health, how many complex areas there are and how overwhelming and anxiety inducing managing all of them is. As professionals, we all have things we can do to help. If we're able to come together, we can make the greatest change for the people who need it. So how do we do this? Um, this is going to be a change more to the 
mechanisms of how we can change instead of why we may need the interdisciplinary approach. So um, by no means is this exhaustive, but some of the common ways that people can get organized and enact change include grassroots movements, direct lobbying, indirect lobbying, uh, campaign contributions, and expert analysis and research. So uh, grassroots movements, which can be defined as a social or political movement that is organized and driven by ordinary people, rather than your established institutions or organizations. Um, they typically are initiated by individuals or small groups of people who share a common concern or goal, who work to mobilize or join others in the pursuit of that goal. Um, some characteristics might be bottom-up organizations, um, having a local focus, um, as you'll see, you know, direct action, inclusiveness, and grassroots funding. Um, so some of the things that may be, um, you might see um, grassroots movements or protesters doing are protesting, uh, local letter writing to uh, show that there is a problem or a need in the community, organizing strikes or boycotts, although they're not technically the same thing, similar enough, um, awareness raising and direct action. You know, what we can think of this is um, um, some of the sit-ins that we've seen in our country's history um, for people living with HIV, what they call die-ins, um, and really making sure that there is this, this um, consciousness in the community. Then we have direct lobbying, which is the act of attempting to influence policymakers and legislators through domestic direct communication, uh, meetings, phone calls, letters. Um, when we think about uh, direct lobbying, this is what we think of when we're talking about going to meet with congressmen and women. Um, this is giving testimonies on the floor, attending events and rallies, um, very official type of actions. Um, this is where a lot of times as professionals, we can step in and can leverage our contacts at our professional organization. APA, both for you know, psychiatrists and uh, psychologists, NASW, the ACA, you know, whatever organization we belong to. Um, and this helps to demonstrate that there is large scale social interest here and that you're not just an angry social worker or a doctor. The power of collectivism cannot be understated here. And if enough of us come forward, we're able to demonstrate that to our legislators, there is a need. Indirect lobbying can um, still be seen as lobbying, but not as official. This is uh, mainly a grassroots strategy um, that involves the attempt to influence policymakers and legislators by mobilizing public support for an issue or policy. Um, so some of these things can include public service announcements, you know, uh, news stories, small scale litigation and coalition building. Um, one really big way that people have learned to use is social media. Um, and then, you know, as professionals, as we are really, um, as we are really busy people, Finding people to donate time or money to can be a great way to also um, contribute to change. Um, so identifying candidates who have progressive values. The one that popped to my head is Bernie Sanders or AOC. Researching economic stances um, to make sure that they're in line with your social and political views and uh, Sp spending money to help cover the cost of running their campaign campaign or advertising are also really effective strategies as well. Expert analysis. This falls on us as professionals. We can provide the analysis and lobby for this change. Um, those that are in positions can also use their ability to um, network or research to establish the best evidence-based practices. So um, Aldo says, Paul, if you guys wanted to answer this, what method of change do you like the best? Um, would you say you're a fan of grassroots, direct lobbying, indirect lobbying, contributing to campaigns or expert analysis? 
You can go ahead and put those in the chat box and Linda will share them. All of the above. <laughs> I was going to say that, but I grass didn't want roots, um, Grassroots, then expert analysis, all direct lobbying, all of the above, direct lobbying, grassroots, and all of the above once again and again. Oh. The data nerd in me wants to save these responses and just plot them on a graph. <sighs> oh, wow. All of them, all of them, all of the above, grassroots and direct lobby, and grassroots. Okay. So it seems like we have a good mix of people uh, and answers, which is fantastic. All right. Modern problems require modern solutions. Um, so one thing I think that should be really um, stated here that consumer rights movements um, are here to safeguard um, and enforce our rights as consumers. Um, and it may be a problem if this is the first time you're hearing that you have a right or have rights as consumers. Um, if you wanna know more, there's a consumerfinance.gov. I've listed some of them out here. Um, you know, some of these things you'll see in the movements um, may not be listed directly, but it uh, they're here because they're tied in to the relationship of consumer worker spectrum. Um, so we can see there's heavy interplay between workers' rights, safe working conditions, working hours, and work-life balance um, as an interconnected nature of humans being both consumers as well as workers. So, a little bit of history again. Um, so this is important. Prior consumer rights movements that have worked. Quality and products, uh, quality and safety of products rather in the 60s and 70s, anti-sweatshop in the 80s and 90s, anti-globalization movement in the 90s to 2000s, as well as um, Occupy Wall Street from 2011 and onward. So the relevance of these movements, um, oh, one that's a little bit more recent um, is Fight for 15. Um, and this movement grew out of a series of strikes and protests by fast food workers in New York City circa about 2012. And it was organized by a coalition of labor and community groups, including the Service Employees International Union and the New York Community for Change. Uh, these workers, many of whom were earning the minimum wage or just above it, which we have uh, discovered is about 725 if we're going federally, were struggling to make ends meet and wanted better pay and benefits. The movement has since grown to include workers in other industries such as healthcare, retail, transportation, and has spread to cities across the country. Um, overall, the movement is driven by workers themselves rather than large, well-funded organizations or political parties, despite what some people may think and push. Uh, although one thing I think that we should take a minute to really look at the um, the the picture and where it is and certain details. I'm not going to say things by names, but you know, it's there. Um, so Fight for 15 demands a minimum wage, a living minimum wage, as we talked about. Um, and at the time of 2012, it was about $15, which is why it's Fight for 15. They also have fought, as I said, for better working conditions across different um, occupations. Um, so contextualizing this in what I was saying, um, affected areas here, this is uh, breeding solidarity between people um, in healthcare, legal, retail, business, policy, and social welfare. It's engaging social change through grassroots movements, as I'm going to go back up here, as you can see, that's very clearly a protest. Indirect lobbying. I, I first learned about it as a millennial on social media and how it was controlling, how it can help control the narrative of public support. And although this was not there in its inception, um, eventually they even testified before Congress. Um, and we're still seeing a lot of resistance on this, but um, you know, as we see for things like COVID, um, minimum wage in some places, at least locally, has started to change a little. Um, so, kind of coming to a close here, 
you know, why consumer rights movements are important, why they matter, they're vital because they recognize the need for better working con uh, conditions, they can uh, promote competition, reduce poverty, promote social and economic justice, and provide opportunities for those who feel like they might have been priced out of Congress. You know, overall, the movements like Fight for 15 are important because they advocate for social and economic change, improve working conditions, and a better standard of living for low-wage workers who are oftentimes the most valuable and in need. So let's talk next steps. Um, there will be a handout that uh, will be coming out tomorrow, I believe, with uh, an email. Um, and it will have some of these, um, these resources here. Uh, and that is how to find your elected official and write to them. Um, there is starting your own chapter for Fight for 15, even though it should be like 18 or 20 now. Um, joining your professional service organization, the NASW, the American Nursing Association, the American Counselors Association, APA for psychologists or psychiatrists, maybe your real estate agent, the National Association of Realtors, or joining a collective labor organization, the AFL-CIO, SCIU, or others. And by no means are these exhaustive, just some common ones. Um, vote, that's important. Um, in the uh, handout, I have a place where you can try and find your polling location. Um, and this kind of gets lost sometimes, um, visiting your local chamber of commerce and advocating to the businesses directly for uh, a fair wage on a micro scale. And if you like what I'm saying, consider uh, taking some of the financial social work trainings. They really do help. Um, so in summary, we have a systems problem. We want you to stay informed, review the information out there. You can't spend money that you just don't have. It's really going to take the whole village. Modern financial rights movements do work. Be the change maker. Don't wait for the change and stay woke, not broke. Rita? Paul, that was terrific. Thank you so very much. Okay, I am going to share with you before we get to our questions and answers a few final thoughts that I always like to share any opportunity I have. And we started off today talking about no one chooses to have money problems, but most people do. The good news is that no one can or needs to know everything about money, but everyone needs to know certain things about money. And what I need to know may be different than what you need to know or, or the, your office mate or someone in your um, home needs to know. We need to remember that everyone has a relationship with money and itself and most need healed. Healing your relationship with yourself takes time, honesty, less self-criticism and more self-love. And healing your relationship with your money begins with your thoughts, feelings, attitudes, values, and experiences with money. When we talk about money, what are we really talking about? We're talking about safety and security. We're talking about survival. And we're talking about power because those who have the money have the power. So finally, we're going to talk about never stop working to make peace and make friends with your money. Let's end this cycle of generation after generation of financially illiterate men and women growing up in this country. Let's teach our children how to create financial well-being and let's reduce this relationship between finances and suicide because that should never be a death sentence. One must always choose life. We have additional resources for you. Next month, our free monthly webinar is on the trends in gambling since gambling has been 
introduced to so many new areas and so much is online today. Then we have in July, disrupting the cycles of poverty and foster care with financial social work. We now have the financial health and wellness professional community. It's a membership organization committed to helping clients overcome money challenges and build wealth. We gather several times a month to interact, learn, network, connect, and expand client resources and to support each other across diverse client, client populations. The annual fee is $99, but for Mental Health Month, which we're in, May is Mental Health Month, we're offering a 40% discount on the membership, and that is the discount code right there. We'd love to have you join us. We also have a partner program on our website. If you refer people to the certification or any of our other um, products or our community, you receive a 10% commission and the person who makes the purchase receives a 10% discount. On our website, we have wonderful essays from our graduates and we are currently this year offering pay what you can on the financial social work certification. Uh, it has been $695 for many years, but we know that during this inflationary period, it may be difficult for some people to get certified. So we've developed this current model and our students have six months to complete the certification. It includes 20 CEUs from NASW and all of the materials in the final exam. And that concludes our official portion of this training. Linda, are there questions? Uh, well, while we wait for some questions to come in, I will um, let the folks who have asked already, I'll remind you that slides are not available, but the recording will be sent to you via the recording in the handout that Paul has worked so hard on will be sent to you via email. And there was an earlier question about, Paul, are you aware of any bills currently up for vote that we should be aware of regarding poverty and lifting families out of poverty? Is there something on the floor, I guess, is the question that we should be lobbying for Paul I keep getting muted um sorry um there's not any particular one that I've heard of in a moment that we should um try and support or rally around I know there is some um there is some discussions about some marriage equality and asset protection for people with disabilities but the name is escaping me right now um, what i can do is i can um, follow up with rita um, and if there's anything any literature that i find i can have her send it out in the the follow-up if that's okay with you rita absolutely okay we have 190 folks and um, Paul, you've done a really thorough job because I don't, we don't have any questions oh. that are coming in. Well, gosh, I appreciate everyone. Thank you so much. I know that everyone appreciates the terrific training you did for us, Paul. I thank you and I look forward to having you come back and do additional trainings for us. Well, thanks everyone, stay well, and I hope to see you back here next month. Bye. Bye everyone, thank you. Bye now. Bye, thank you.